Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Welcome to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today, the author Toby Lester is joining us to talk about his two books. He's the acclaimed author of two books about a couple of great achievements of the Renaissance that are actually familiar items in modern life. The first one, called The Fourth Part of the World, was published in 2009, and it's about the development over centuries of a world map. The fourth part of that map is America, a new discovery at the time, and it was the great Waldseemuller map of 1507, and it included America. But the important point is that this famous map and those leading up to it represent major changes in European understanding of geography and the Earth itself. In Da Vinci's Ghost, which is released this year, we learn that the iconic Vitruvian man was both a mystical and a mathematical symbol in the Renaissance, and that combination, which is to us a contradiction, was sophisticated thinking for centuries. Learning about Vitruvian man reminds us that many of the sciences emerged from magic and mysticism, and that the progression of reason was very slow and uneven. Both books are absorbing tracks through one of the richest intellectual periods in Western history, and they are guaranteed great reading. And both books offer a wealth of information about Renaissance history, art, uh, technology, architecture, philosophy, and science. Today, uh, Toby Lester will talk about the two books and about a lot of the background uh, behind this period that sort of emerged uh, eventually in science. Toby Lester, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. And I'd like to start by asking about the two books themselves. You were a journalist. You've written on a great many uh, topics. So you're a very comprehensive person. And these are both about the Renaissance period. Could you just give us a kind of synopsis of the two books to sure. get us started? Sure. Uh, the first book, as you said, is the fourth part of the world, uh, and it tells the story of the Waldseemuller world map of 1507, which is the very first map to um, unambiguously show North and South America as surrounded by water, uh, which was a big, big milestone in European thought. Uh, previous to that, the world had been assumed to consist of three parts, Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa, and then with the discovery of the New World, it continued to be thought of in those three part um, ways until this map, uh, which demonstrated for the first time that there was a landmass out there across the ocean mm -hmm. that was not attached to the old tripartite system. Uh, and what I, what I did in the book basically was tell the story of this one great map, which was in, in fact the map that gave America its name, not just the first map to use the name America. Uh, the makers of the map actually made the name up um, <coughs> in honor of America. Amerigo Vespucci, whom they believed had discovered uh, America. Uh, but that I used that map uh, as a kind of starting point and an end point, and in between, I back way up and basically talk about the centuries-long um, collective enterprise, often unintentional and often guided by um, uh, um, ideas that today seem fanciful or backwards to <laughs> us, that ultimately allowed people to imagine their way to a conception of the world as a whole in 1507. This map was produced before Magellan sailed around the world, so it's a kind of imaginary document, but it's a testament to the power of Renaissance thought, which um, believed that, uh, in fact, the world was knowable, and that's kind of a, uh, an end point for the book, that 
you can map the world, you can understand the world, uh, and that's the sort of scientific idea that we still have. We're working on trying to figure out the world. Um, da Vinci's Ghost takes place uh, roughly in the same time mm -hmm. period. Um, the 1490 is when da Vinci uh, is generally considered to have drawn Vitruvian Man, the famous figure of the nude man in a circle in a square. Uh, and again, in this book, like the first book, uh, I decided I wanted to uh, take this single object uh, and unpack as much as I could about what was in the picture. Uh, and in doing so, uh, I tell two stories, a big one and a small one. It's somewhat like the way I did in the fourth part of the world. Uh, the small story is the story of Leonardo himself and in the years leading up to the drawing of this picture, what he was up to, uh, the kind of environment that he was living and working in. And then the bigger story is the story of the ideas embedded in the picture, uh, which ultimately stretch way back to antiquity and the genesis of um, <clears throat> the figure that we've got here. Uh, so in both cases, they're books about ideas. Uh, they're books about single objects that, um, when you pay close attention to them, yield all sorts of stories and um, information. Can you give us an idea about the historical context of the two books? What's happening in this period? What's the time that we're talking about sure. and I suppose where the, a lot of this takes yeah. place? Well, um, both of them in some way or another are rooted in Renaissance Italy. Mm -hmm. um, although the Waldseemuller map is made in um, Germany, what today we would call Germany. Um, but uh, a lot of the, the kind of processing of the ideas happens in Italy uh, in both cases. In the case of the fourth part of the world and the mapping of the world, um, Florence is a, an important area. In fact, that's where Amerigo Vespucci was um, originally from. Uh, and it, w One of the things that got me very interested in um, the age of discovery was Portugal and Spain were the countries that were yeah. Um, sort of uh, making, making the voyages, and yet it was the Italians who were not only the ones who were leading the expeditions, you can think of Columbus, you can think of Vespucci, you can think of John Cabot, uh, all of whom were Italians and all of whom were credited with discovering various parts of the New Worlds for Europe, yeah. um, but at the same time they were funded by the Italians, um, and it was the Italians who in a number of ways were the ones who received the raw information that came back from the voyages of discovery and fitted them into uh, the kind of bigger picture thinking. Um, humanism is the milieu okay. for a lot of this, uh, although um, one of the things that came across to me very powerfully as I was researching both books is that um, although today we like to divide things very neatly between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, uh, nobody at the time was making those divisions and in fact uh, there are some pretty medieval ideas that were still very powerful uh, and powerfully at play in Leonardo's picture and in the Waldseemuller map. Right. Um, that's an important thing. First of all, uh, this, this sort of, uh, is they have a compressed view of history back then. They're not thinking, I guess, oh my gosh, we're on the edge of something entirely new. They're not self-conscious until quite late, maybe. Is that yeah, the well, case? Yeah, and in, in the context of humanism, and by humanism I guess we can say it's the movement that, that started uh, in a kind of small way in the, in the 14th century and then really blossomed in the 15th century to revive a lot of the ancient Roman and Greek texts that contain a lot of ancient knowledge about the world that hadn't been forgotten but that had been sort of put aside in part because it didn't serve a specifically Christian agenda. Um, a lot of these manuscripts, uh, the humanists in Italy especially but also in, in um, other countries in Europe, uh, began to seek out and find and then revive uh, <coughs> in the 1400s. Um, in the case of geography, uh, Ptolemy's geography, a Greek manuscript that had been um, virtually lost for centuries, reappears in Florence in the early 1400s and has a decisive role to play in how people thought about science uh, and how people processed the whole age of discovery um, throughout the 15, 15th century. Uh, and then in the case of Leonardo, um, 
stop. I kind of lost my train of thought yeah, here. Well, I was going to say that that picks up another ancient idea. Well, not maybe not as ancient as mm -hmm. Ptolemy, right? But right. the idea of uh, of the engineering of mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and architecture, and architecture so, as being yeah. holy. <laughs> you know, and, and in the case of and in the case of Leonardo. Um, uh, there's a revival of Vitruvius, who was an ancient Roman architect, who um, gathered together uh, architectural information, and by architecture the Romans also meant engineering, uh, and a lot of the sciences of, of building and of waging war, in fact. Yeah. Um, uh, Vitruvius assembled all that and put it in a single manuscript, which itself, like Ptolemy's geography, was virtually lost for centuries, and then brought back in Renaissance Florence especially. Um, in part because the Florentines were very interested in rebuilding uh, Rome, as it were, in a kind of metaphorical way, but literally rebuilding Florence in the classical style. Vitruvius was a source for how to uh, build in the classical style. So they could have used the word Renaissance very easily, meaning rebirth of something, ancient ideas, right. for and them recapturing these lost manuscripts and so on. Can you give us an idea of what Florence was, what's happening in Florence at this time or globally at this time sure. for these people that uh, helped shape the kind of fluorescence that we see, I sure. suppose, at this time? Um, well, imagine that Florence is coming out of a period where it's a fairly small town of moneylenders and cloth makers, uh, but uh, it starts to also have banks, um, in part because of its political structure, which changes. Um, and increasingly, its banks are funding all of the, uh, the, the royalty of Europe as they em embark on their various adventures uh, and get increasingly in debt to the Florentines who amass considerable wealth and want agents mm. all over the world in order to continue to amass their wealth. So as the Age of Discovery gets underway, um, Florentines are always there. They're in part helping sponsor these voyages. Uh, and then, in fact, are the ones who are encouraging the revival of ancient texts in order to figure out how they themselves represent a kind of imperial heir to Rome itself. Um, one of the interesting things that I talk about in the fourth part of the world uh, concerning maps is that when they revived the ancient maps of Ptolemy, uh, and I should say in the geography, Ptolemy laid out basically the system that we use today for mapping latitude mm -hmm. and longitude, um, and then provided hundreds of place names in the ancient world. Um, when Renaissance humanists first revived Ptolemy in the ancient world, they didn't really think about its applications going forward as a way of mapping the modern world and including incorporating the, the, the new world discoveries. Instead, they, um, they saw it as a tool for reconstructing the past. Um, it was uh, af after a long, period of not really knowing what the ancient world had been like. Here they had maps that showed them very, very specifically either what the ancient world had been like or what people imagined the world was like in ancient times, which allowed them to make sense of all sorts of historical texts. It was the beginning of a process of assembling ancient history and ancient learning. Uh, so geographical studies per se weren't necessarily designed to um, make sense of modern geography. And that one of the things that came across to me in both of these books is that what you think you're working on in any kind of scientific endeavor isn't necessarily what ends up being the, 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 the <laughs> most <still> true. <laughs> um, important fruit. Yeah. Uh, it was only 50 years later that people began to realize that Ptolemy in his mathematical system of mapping would allow people a way to incorporate all sorts of geographical information that was coming back from Asia, from Africa, mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. New World, and literally be on the same page and map a single vision of the world that everybody could look at and refine together. And it's a sort of collective enterprise. Everybody, if you've got the same basic mapping principles mm -hmm. and you get information from different places, you can you collectively, in a kind of Wikipedia-like way, um, come up with a map of the world. And that ultimately is the, the achievement of the Waldseemuller map. It's, it's an achievement of this unknown crew of scholars who produce that map. Um, it's also a grand collective achievement. Yeah. And that's one of the main points I was trying to get across in the right. book. Right, and it's collective over a long period of time and not everybody knew each other, so it's not like the team that right. we would use today that might be international. It's international, but it's past 
even over generations, right? right. And, and certainly centuries and so on, and you describe it um, you know, very well. I want to ask, before we leave that historical context, I see that Florence is a kind of international center. Uh, it's incredibly wealthy and it wants to show it off. And people that are very promising, like young Leonardo, are drawn to this, correct? Mm -hmm. That's the place to be. And you can make your career. There's, there are two more things that I'd like to ask about. And one is the place of people like Leonardo, who was not a PhD, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and he wasn't a college graduate or anything like that, but he had a sensibility that was a part of that time, if yeah. I understand. Sure. Well, uh, he, did, he had a sensibility that was, that was of his time, but he also was bucking convention as well. And one, um, for a long time, there had been separate traditions. There was scholarship, and then there were art, mm -hmm. art, artists who were artisans. They were craftspeople. Mm -hmm. um, they made things. They got their hands dirty. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of um, collaboration or even the idea that an artist could ascend to the ranks of being a scholar mm -hmm. or a philosopher. Um, but in the 15th century in particular, Leonardo, uh, among others, began to try to break down that divide. He really, he believed that um, a lot of scholarship that had come down over the centuries, although it was venerable and uh, authoritative uh, from a kind of classical standpoint, um, was just plain wrong. Um, and he was very interested in empirical observation. Mm -hmm. um, his notebooks are full of um, experiments and sort of playing with ideas uh, and running them up against what traditional authorities had said. Um, and, and he developed an idea that um, he, in many ways, could do science better than science had been done in the past. Uh, he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder, actually, because it seems he was uh, ostracized uh, a considerable uh, amount, uh, especially in Milan, but also in Florence, um, when he aspired to be able to capture scientific truths, especially in his art, but also in his experiments. Uh, people just considered him not educated enough to dare to um, contradict the authority of Aristotle. Uh, Leonardo felt differently. He felt that if he could observe the flight of birds or the, the nature of the human body by dissecting it and could discover something uh, that uh, Aristotle had said was wrong, he would do it. And that's, that seems like um, a very original thing in this time because he's not alone. The craftsmen in general, artists, sculptors, and so on, uh, seem as though they become self aware. Hey, we're important here, mm -hmm. just as the aristocracy over time had to give way to the new. Um, we would say merchant class, I suppose, who were always, you know, despised, yeah. uh, then he, the people like him were very proud of their own brains and their own uh, very conspicuous abilities. They knew that nothing could work without them, in a sense. Well, Is and that sure, the and there, and there's a political dimension to it as well, because Florence was a republic. Uh, they had deliberately overthrown monarchy. Uh, a lot of the other Italian city-states were still run by dictators or despots or whatever you want to call them. Uh, in Florence, there is an ethos of the sort of self-made person um, and uh, the sort of republican spirit, uh, which meant that there wasn't supposed to be at least a kind of uh, arist aristocratic um, umbrella over everything. Uh, if, you, if you were a merchant and you happened to make a lot of money, you could rise up and you could become you know, as powerful as the de' Medici family. Yeah. Right, but he is, has such a wide range of capabilities. Could you just list a few of his, his many talents and for us, just to refresh memories? Sure. Well, let's just start with just a, a small um, summary of his life. He, he was born in 1452 in the town of Vinci, um, and it, it, we lo know very little about his early years, but, but at the age of about 14, um, he had clearly proven himself so precocious as a young artist, untrained, unschooled, or at least not formally schooled, uh, that his father got him an apprenticeship in Florence working with one of the great masters of the day, uh, Verrocchio. Um, and da Vinci immediately, um, under Verrocchio, 
uh, began to demonstrate himself as a very quick study. He could draw, he could sculpt, um, he could think in visual terms in ways that others couldn't. There's an anecdote about how um, as da Vinci became better and better, he did what a lot of apprentices did. He would start to help the master finish a painting. Uh, and Verrocchio asked da Vinci to do an angel alongside <coughs> one of his uh, central figures in a painting, and he drew an angel of such beauty that Verrocchio gave up painting. <laughs> um, that may or may not be literally true, but it captures the spirit of the man, I think. But in addition to his kind of preternatural gifts as an artist, uh, he had, I would say, some of the best powers of observation that anybody has ever had. He was always observing and watching and studying, trying to make sense of things. Um, and he could translate what he was seeing into visual yeah. uh, information. A lot of people were seeing the same thing, and even, you know, there were plenty of observant people, but Leonardo was able to see something and even imagine how it might be taken apart and displayed. You, know, you think of a, a, you know, a, a manual of how to assemble a bicycle or something today, right. and you get all the pieces sort of exploded out, and you can see how they all come apart, and then you can put them together. Da Vinci was one of the pioneers of doing that, and uh. in fact, when he studied the human body, um, he dissected human bodies, um, and then, based on what he saw, was able to do the kind of exploded view of the human body where he'd sort of take apart the vertebrae so that you could see how they all connected and give you a sense of how they came together. Um, so, he was an anatomist, he studied human proportions, he worked in architecture, he di designed all sorts of um, machines. Including um, weapons? Weapons, <laughs> Anything yeah. they wanted. <laughs> right, no, I mean, and, but for da Vinci it didn't, it wasn't so important what he was working on because yeah. he was ultimately after the kind of scientific principles that underlay weapon. You know, if it was the human body or if it was a weapon system, what he was interested in were the physics yeah. and the hydraulics and the pneumatics and the optics. Um, he wanted first causes. Uh, so studying um, how to build a giant catapult was not that different from studying how the arm can lift uh, a, a heavy weight. Right. A couple more things about this, just the historical background was uh, the explorations of people like Marco Polo and this impact that might have had and the other outsiders that were the Greek scholars that mm -hmm. were sort of rescued as the Byzantine Empire fell apart and stuff. Could you give us just a little bit of sure. the background about that to color the idea of yeah. Florence? Well, so Florence, in the first half of the century in Florence, um, you get this burgeoning renaissance and this interest in, this interest in classical studies. Um, and some of the early humanists pretty quickly realize that although they're, they're good Latin scholars and they're able to revive and understand a lot of either ignored or lost uh, ancient Roman texts, when it comes to Greek, they're almost helpless. Mm -hmm. They don't know Greek. Um, Greek, the Roman Empire split into an East and Western half um, <coughs> centuries before. And in Western Europe, um, knowledge of Greek just dissipated. Uh, it remained in what we call Byzantium, um, and there, were, there was a tradition of scholarship of Greek manuscripts in Byzantium, but East and West didn't like each other. They represented mm -hmm. two different kinds of Christianity. Um, and it wasn't actually until about the beginning of the 15th century that um, Greek scholars began to come and be invited to, uh, to Florence in particular, where a sort of hardcore group of humanists uh, began to train themselves in Greek. That was still somewhat of a trickle, although they did bring manuscripts like Ptolemy's geography back. Uh, but then in the middle of the century, when the Turks took over Constantinople, there was a kind of exodus of um, Greek scholars uh, who fled Constantinople because they didn't want to be there with the Turks. Uh, and they, in large numbers, came to Italy, uh, Florence, Rome, and other places as well. Uh, and brought with them their precious manuscripts. And there became a much more integrated study of um, the ancient Greek and Roman past. That's very interesting. Is it? So it's like a global population is building there and then the uh, people are also exploring uh, sort of at this time. There's a lot of overlap and well, so and on. Well, it, and it, it all kind of meshes together because, and this is why I said that the, the Florence was a kind of central processing unit yeah. in a way because by the, by the late 15th century, Florentines and other Italians and Germans uh, and others had become pretty good at the study of Greek and they had revived a number of manuscripts that had been lost. 
for example, you had Ptolemy's geography, which was now pretty well understood. Yeah. So when you have Marco Polo and later travelers visiting the Far East, and when you have others visiting Africa, now these scholars could look at texts by yeah. Ptolemy or Strabo or somebody and say, well, where, where are they now and where, what does that represent in terms of ancient knowledge of the world? And most importantly in this story, um, how can we possibly make sense of this new place that, that is across the ocean that Columbus and Vespucci are visiting that doesn't really seem to be talked about by anybody? Yes, and they had a very different theory about the world, about land and water relation and stuff, right? So they... Yeah, that no, there, there were all sorts of ideas floating around, some of which said that you couldn't have land on the other side, that the known world was <laughs> Europe, Asia, and Africa, but there had to be only water on the other side of the world. Some people said that there might be land in a kind of symmetrically balanced way, but that it couldn't support life. Um, so it was very vexing when Europeans discovered that there was not only life, but there were humans in great numbers, and in <laughs> fact, you know, pretty civilized uh, cultures. Um, then, you know, did these people descend from Noah, who had apparently right. been in one ark and then had settled somewhere in Europe? How did they get there? There were all sorts of kind of theological questions that were raised, philosophical right. questions. Um, a little unsettling at yeah. the same time, yeah. right? Which takes us to, like, the mentality. And you have some wonderful graphics in both of the books to demonstrate that. And so the mentality of this period is like a, a foot in two or three different eras and worlds, isn't it? Sure. And that comes out really well in this in the in the two books together. Um, but first of all, could we, we maybe start with the map idea to get an sure. idea of the worldview of these people? And you had uh, the wonderful um, maps with Jerusalem is the center yeah. <laughs> of the well, world, I'll, I'll show you one and, of those and so on. We start with that and then go sure. and have a look at the Da Vinci stuff as well. What we've got is uh, what's known as a TO map of the world. Uh, it, for, it's named that for good reason, uh, because we're looking at uh, an O with a T in it. That red encircling everything can represent the ocean that surrounds Europe, Asia, and Africa, largely. Uh, and then the T is actually bodies of water as well. Um, separating at the top um, <coughs> uh, Europe from Asia. Asia is the semicircle all the way at the top. Um, the bottom quarter on the left is Europe and then the bottom quarter on the right is Africa. So uh, Europe and Africa are separated by the Mediterranean and then the, the top of the T as it were is a river in Russia separating Europe from Asia and the bottom of the T is the Nile separating uh, Asia from Africa. Um, all of this has Jerusalem as its center because that's a kind of spiritual focal point. Um, and then uh, Christ is embodying the world yeah. in, in two forms. It's a, it's a map of the earth and the human Christ is embodying the earth and then uh, the kind of Godhead figure, the Father, uh, is embodying and embracing the cosmos. Um, and I chose this map just because it offers a kind of neat um, visual wormhole into the idea of Vitruvian man as well. Uh, Leonardo Right. in drawing his figure of a man in a circle in a square um, was definitely playing within this tradition. Um, he, he probably wasn't um, looking at a map exactly like this when he did the picture, but these, right. uh, these kinds of images were in the air. Um, and he would have been playing with ideas of the microcosm, the idea that the human body um, can be considered a kind of miniature model of the universe. Um, and that whole idea of the microcosm is, is a very, very powerful engine of thought. If you can study the human body, you're going to learn about the whole world. Likewise, if you study the heavens, you're going to be able to figure out influences that act on the body. Yeah. So they, the, the, they have a totally different worldview of what's in this, mm -hmm. but also this is very much linked to a religious idea. So you, it's very easy to understand from this sort of thing that the Earth is the center of everything yep. here, and Jerusalem is the center of the center, yep. and Although humans, and so on. It, 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 it's interesting to note that um, a lot of these maps put Jerusalem at the center, which has, has made a lot of people sort of dismiss the people who made these maps as being backwards geographically. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just didn't understand that the world couldn't possibly look like this. In fact, there, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that in the Middle Ages, people had a much better understanding of actual physical geography than we now can deduce from just looking at maps like this, they were choosing very deliberately to distort 
um, their vision of the world so that they could fit Jerusalem at the center and so that they could make these things correspond um, to all sorts of um, kind of um, previous ideas that they wanted mm -hmm. to demonstrate. It's no surprise that the world's divided into three. Um, there's the Trinity, yeah. there's the idea that Noah had three sons. Um, in, the, in the Middle Ages, people liked to divide things into three. So if you're going to map the world, you're going to see how you can find three in it and then twist it so that it all fits into a circle because the circle represents perfection. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Yeah, so they have an imposed logic yeah. there. And we haven't moved too far from that no, either. Ways, we no. still do it. We still do it. And then uh, the mysticism that you sort of uh, uh, talked about there, it's, it's really pervasive still, is it? Uh, I mean, in this time. Can you give us a sense of that? And uh, sure. that, that there, uh, the, uh, it seems to infuse as well all of what we would call science, then called natural yeah. philosophy, I suppose. But yeah. you keep bumping into these mystical kinds yeah. of ideas. Well, it's 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 just too easy to say that you know the Renaissance got rid of all <laughs> kinds of magical thinking um, that pervaded thought for centuries in the Middle Ages. Uh, there was a lot of magical thinking, but within that context, there was a lot of scientific thinking. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading something uh, about uh, the Middle Ages where um, the writer said something like, um, science rode into Europe on the magic carpet of astrology. That the idea being that um, astrology was important to people. The, the belief was that you know, you're, you're, a lot of your life, a lot of your lives and your mental health, medical health, um, the, the, your fate were all determined by your relationship to the heavens, so you really had to stud study the heavens scientifically. And it's kind of um, amazing how meticulously people studied the heavens in order to, um, in, in the service of astrology, which today we don't think very highly of. Um, by the same token, alchemy um, yeah. what, was something that people exercised themselves greatly to figure out, producing, producing <laughs> what we would call scientific results into the, in, in the understanding of metals and, and um, yeah. um, the behavior of minerals, all that kind of thing. So uh, it, one of the things I was trying to get across in the book is how hard it is actually to untangle all of this stuff, mm -hmm. that you can't just discredit these these images. Okay, uh, there are two more things that I'd like to ask sure. you about this. Refresh our memories, please. What is the significance of the circle and the square? Because these come up, as yeah. you said, in the map, but yeah. very definitely in, uh, in Da Vinci here. Sure. Okay. Um, I go into it at some length in the book, and it's a little bit hard to unpack in, in a condensed form, but um, the short answer is uh, the circle since ancient times, probably since before recorded history, has symbolized and represented a kind of perfection and divinity um, for obvious reasons. It's, it's, it's the one shape where every point on the circumference is equidistant from the center. Um, it doesn't have any sharp edges. Uh, it's just uh, long symbolized a kind of perfection. In the ancient world, in the medieval world, in Renaissance thinking, the world was imagined as a, as a collection of concentric spheres. All motion, um, especially heavenly motion, was circular. Um, so in shorthand, when da Vinci's drawing his circle, um, he's alluding to ideas that Vitruvius, the architect mm -hmm. in Roman times, had put down on paper. Um, but the basic idea is that this is a symbol of the divine, uh, the heavens uh, of perfection. Uh, and then the square, by contrast, uh, also had a, a sort of history of uh, representing the earthly and the secular. I mean, squares for the Romans uh, really brought things down to earth. It was how you translated the kind of circular divine power and made, um, made it right with the world. Uh, you, you, you laid out your cities along square plans. Mm -hmm. uh, even personal character was supposed to be square. Um, you, your soldiers marched in squares. All those sorts of things were very human, earthly um, manifestations of this shape. Uh, so in shorthand, the circle is, represents the divine, the square represents the earthly. That's why in that map we were just looking at, yeah. uh, you've got both figures exactly. together, and one is Christ the human, the other is Christ the divinity. Right. Um, 
So it was a very typical thing. And most of us had looked at Vitruvian Man for all our lives and not realized, oh, that circle and the square have right. great significance yeah. there. You might know some of the other stuff. And just one more thing in terms of the mentality that we'll come back to re revisit again in a short while with the modern life is the sense of the other. It's been a nagging problem throughout human history, yeah. and you uh, point to a few of these figures. Uh, I wonder if you tell us two things. Uh, one is Prester John, uh, sure. but the other is Gog and Magog, is sure. that it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, um, we can start with Gog and Magog because yeah. they're, they're, they're mentioned in the Bible, um, and they're, they're talked of as these kind of demonic figures way out in the east somewhere, and the other tends to be way off at the margins of the world. Um, and they, uh, it said one day, they, they, they've been enclosed, they've been contained, they're, they're sort of out of bounds, but one day they will be broken free, and then they will come um, overrun the world, and that will be the beginning of the end times. Uh, and there was a very real fear in the Middle Ages, uh, as I talk about in the fourth part of the world, um, when the Mongols started arriving uh, right. and really overrunning um, all of Central Asia and then um, the Near East and then Europe, that this, they, they were Gog and Magog. And there are quotes from these medieval chroniclers talking about their arrival in those terms. And there was this idea that, in fact, the world was coming to an end. Um, Prester John um, is a kind of related figure. Uh, Christians <coughs> early on had populated the East. Uh, and sort of been forgotten about in the West, um, but then there had been stories trickling back of uh, this very rich, very powerful king named Prester John, who was a Christian king, uh, who had defeated the Mongols uh, way out um, in what today would be Iran. Um, and stories trickled back that this king, in fact, was defeating the Mongols and was now beginning to march back toward Jerusalem, and he would help Europe develop a kind of pincer move on Jerusalem. The Europeans in the Crusades would come from the west, Prester John would march from the east, and Christianity would retake um, Jerusalem, and you know, the world would become one happy Christian place. Um, gradually, as Marco Polo and some of the early missionaries um, moved out to the east, they looked for Prester John and didn't find him. <laughs> uh, and then, um, as the Portuguese began to explore Africa, they began to shift their search for Prester John to Africa. Part of Africa, East Africa, was considered Asia. Uh, they called it India at the time. Uh, India meant what today we loosely call Asia. Um, but anything east of the Nile was kind of considered India. And therefore, Prester John maybe was in Africa, not in Asia. So the Portuguese um, fueled a lot of their exploration of uh, Africa, not uh, out of some kind of disinterested scientific desire to find out what Africa was like, or not even um, completely because they wanted to get around Africa to develop the spice trade with the East, but because they wanted to find Prester John uh, and hook up with all of his money and power. Yeah. Fascinating. And that um, really is. Here he is, the king of Ethiopia, I think, is the, you, it was the story yeah. at the time. But the other interesting thing about him, he's always a mysterious person, and um, he uh, is rich, very rich, and very warlike. So it's, it's sort of a contradiction of the, yeah. of the idea, and I have no idea where that came from, but it was well depicted. Yeah, well, it's, it's a really fun story, but it's, yeah. I mean, it's a fun story, and it's kind of bizarre to us today, but yeah. um, it exerted a very powerful pull on um, all sorts of people as they began to explore the East and then as they began to explore Africa. Very interesting. Uh, I'd like to talk about the new mentality. I wanted to know if you thought uh, there were particular catalysts for the great changes that were coming. We talked about the sort of environment in, in Florence at mm -hmm. the time, but was there anything that sort of changed people in terms of technical or other kinds of discoveries? Lots. Okay. Um, and, and especially in the fourth part of the world, but also in Da Vinci's yes. Ghost, I trace a number of them. Um, early on, in definitely what people today would call the Middle Ages, there were things like the compass yeah. that arrives, uh, the Ptolemy's latitude and longitude, 
maps also are a kind of technology, uh, right. mathematical, the mathematical mapping of the world. Um, people had known about latitude and longitude and, and, and had developed coordinates for a number of places in Europe, but they were at the time only applying them f for astrological reasons. Yeah. So if you could figure out where you were, that wasn't to tell you what the world looked like, it was to tell you where you were in relation to the stars so you could do your horoscope. Um, in the 15th century especially though, people begin to apply um, these kind of cartographic mathematical tools to an understanding of what the world looks like. Um, that's greatly aided by um, the advent of sailors' charts, um, which allowed sailors to sail across open water with the help of a compass. Um, of course, all of this is greatly aided in turn by the printing press, which is, um, you know, comes uh, into the fore in the middle of yeah. the 1500s. 1400s. Right. Um, and the printing press, again, it's, it's one of these things like um, this division between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, tends to be described as this thing that arrived and changed everything. But in, in two fact, weeks. <laughs> uh, it certainly didn't. Uh, and a lot of the early work done by printers was to print old medieval texts that they already had at hand um, that were very popular. So the printing press aided scientific understanding in a lot of ways, yeah. but at the same time, it massively uh, reproduced all sorts of medieval misconceptions about the world as well. So it's a very mixed bag. Uh, and it's not just the clean technological break that it's often described as. Right. I'd just like to pick up on that uh, briefly. You show in the, I don't know which one of the books now, but it is really a painstaking thing to produce a manuscript over centuries. Then you have to preserve them some way. Yeah. Then when you're Leonardo or somebody, you've got to run around looking for these things. So we didn't have the sense of let's run to the bookstore and pick this up uh, at that time. Could you give us just sure. a little idea of that? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about the manuscript age, meaning starting almost in Roman times and then going way through into the Renaissance, um, they were luxury objects. Uh, a manuscript took a lot of time to produce and it often costs a lot of money to have somebody produce it. It's very hard work for the monk or whoever was producing it to diligently go through page after page trying to make sense of the manuscript that he was copying. Um, then it costs a lot of money. Uh, they tended to be valuable so they often were sort of locked to shelves either in a um, some kind of proto-library or at a monastery or in a, in a palace somewhere. Um, so they really were not accessible to a lot of people. Um, you certainly couldn't go to a bookstore and just buy three or four books that you really were interested in. You'd have to have somebody go and get permission to copy and then pay to copy and get yourself a book. So even somebody like Petrarch, who was one of the first great book collectors uh, in, the, in the 1400s, uh, sorry, in the 1300s, 14th century, um, developed a huge library, but his library, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was several hundred books. That's, would have been that was amazing. Yeah. Huh? yeah. So, um, one of the things that the printing press did for a lot of people, including Leonardo da Vinci and including Columbus, was um, allow them to educate themselves because all of a sudden books were cheap and they were portable. So you actually could buy your own library and then actually carry them with you. And he uh, did. And, and both of them yeah. uh, really were autodidacts. They, they, they bought, acquired, and then studied books in a way that wouldn't have been possible for people um, in preceding generations. Both of them were born at almost exactly the same time yeah. and benefited in that first wave of um, the kind of democratization of reading. I was, I was going to say, it seemed like that alone would have had a huge impact, although it's not in two weeks, but it, it just sure. changes your perspective in much the same way that the internet has d opened up Absolutely. knowledge and information to people unable to get to libraries around the world and right. so on. And uh, one more thing, there was, there was some great things for uh, calculating and, and uh, for things like building domes, which is a, a big deal. But another one that I thought was particularly interesting is the uh, perspectograph. Mm -hmm. Do you, did that change people very much? Leonardo seems to have been much taken with it. Yeah, well, so um, 15th century Florence, among its many um, achievements, was uh, the, the, the invention, basically, of linear perspective, the technique that allows you to draw uh, and make something look three-dimensional, look like the objects in the picture are organized 
in a realistic way. Um, Leonardo, among others, was very taken with this idea, and there's some uh, theorizing about the fact that Ptolemy's geography helped people develop this idea. The, the, in order to draw using the techniques that 15th century Florentines used to produce linear perspective, you had to create a grid, uh, and then you see some of these early guys talking about how they have to make sort of the latitude and longitude on their, on their, um, on their painting, um, so that you can locate the coordinates of these various things in the picture. Um, it's a, a very rational mathematical system for mm -hmm. ordering space, mm -hmm. which is exactly what uh, a map using latitude and longitude is as well. Uh, so the idea, in a way, was a very practical one. Uh, and I have, there's a picture of Leonardo mm -hmm. um, using what he called a perspectograph, which is allowing him to draw a picture of the world. Um, but it's also a kind of metaphysical proposition because especially at this period, people were beginning to imagine that, that you know, God was an architect of the world. If he was yeah. an architect of the world, then he was using architectural mathematical principles to come up with the perfect design of the world. So there was a kind of under structure of the world that you could get at. Uh, and if you could see things in perspective, in the proper perspective, uh, <coughs> map everything, uh, and that applies for knowledge as well as geography, yeah. then you could really assemble a vision of the world that's a lot like the vision of the world that people imagined God had. And Leonardo himself, in talking about his work and his painting in particular, often describes himself as trying to um, sort of acquire a sort of divine mind. Right. There's another thing that comes up in this period, and that is the transfer, I guess, of the medical documents and knowledge, which mm -hmm. was quite substantial from the ancients and then to the Arabs, mm -hmm. and that this made its way into Europe. Do you think that that shaped uh, any of the new thinking as well? Oh, it definitely did. And, um, and it, it's a, um, there was a huge body of work uh, from the ancient world on medicine, particularly one writer named Galen, but a number of others as well, Aristotle. Um, and some of these ideas had trickled into Europe um, by uh, in the early centuries of the Middle Ages, but a lot of them were preserved only in Greek manuscripts that the that the Arabs then translated into right. Arabic, and then um, as there became a kind of integration in Spain, especially uh, between uh, Muslim and more. Christian scholars, those ideas that had been translated into Arabic then made their way into Latin. Um, so now they've been translated several times, and they're not necessarily true to the original always. But um, you see in the in the thirteenth century. 14th century, a lot of these medical texts being revived, and there's an interest in um, medicine and in the anatomy. study of anatomy, the study of the human body. Um, but there's a kind of reluctance to um, go against the received wisdom. And even Leonardo, um, who dissected uh, bodies, yeah. initially, in some of his very famous drawings of skulls and things, um, goes in looking to find what medieval brain theory or anatomical theory tells him is there and doesn't necessarily draw exactly what he would have seen. Um, as he goes on in his career, he uh, increasingly jettisons these received notions and just purely becomes a describer of um, the data that is before him. Right. That's a big sea change right there. Yeah. We all have this problem. It's just a human problem. You yeah. begin with a belief or a bias or whatever and you ignore things and we have rather famous scientists just refusing to believe what their math tells them. Einstein comes to mind, but yeah. we go through it all the time. We are happily at an age where we're sometimes at least able to say, whoops, that was a mistake and start over again. And, but it must have been really difficult at that time for yeah. people to make that kind of a, of a shift and look at facts as they saw them. Do you see other kinds of parallels between this kind of thing in the, in the time of the Renaissance and today. We talked about the, the business of information dissemination and, uh, the, and how 
printing and so on would just open up a whole new world for people, many more people. Do you see any other yeah. kinds of things, parallels? But, well, there, yeah, I think there are a lot. The, I mean, printing, the printing press internet parallel is one that kind of just jumps to mind. Mm -hmm. And it, there are all sorts of related um, ideas. I mean, the printing, the printing press sort of democratized the distribution of information uh, in the way that the internet has, and it it was not limited to good stuff. So you get a lot of people complaining about all the <laughs> bad things that suddenly are available to everybody, and the the wrong ideas that are getting um, distributed. And then you know Martin Luther comes along, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he has this way of um, getting information out that hadn't been available to others before, and it really became a problem for the church. Um, Wikipedia, this idea of collective, yeah, yeah. collective enterprise. That I mean, really, the, the the printing of something like the map of the world. Uh, everybody, literally, for the first time, before before uh, the, this, let's say the Waldseemuller map, 1507. Mm -hmm. Generally, when people talked about a world map, they didn't have just one picture in mind. Today, we think of a world map. We think of the world map. It's obvious. You know, it's got these continents, but there were all sorts of different ways of imagining the world. Um, and if you said world map to 10 people, they would think of 10 different pictures. Um, after Ptolemy, after the printing press, after the discovery of the new world, you get this one picture that everybody's working on. And now, in a kind of Wikipedia-like way, somebody over here adds a little something, somebody over here adds a little something. Everybody collectively is refining this one document. Um, so that's, I think, a very powerful mm -hmm. parallel to today maybe some sort of shared resources too, which is something open source kinds of things sure. that people all contribute to things, which is a rather recent, a recent idea yeah, uh, so, for, for sure. us, but it was, a, uh, it was taken for granted. That time people weren't running around, it seems to me, with patents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. No, and I mean the idea... You keep, improve, you keep improving on things maybe, I, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. In our last remaining minutes, I'd like to talk about you. And I'd like to start by saying I, I understand you started out in the Peace Corps. You didn't plan to end up writing these books, but uh, you made a migration yourself from something. Can you give us an idea of that? Okay. Um, I studied English and French in college, um, subjects that people often choose when they don't know what they want to do. <laughs> and then I went into the Peace Corps, which is also a thing you, don't, you do when you don't know what to do. Um, I went to Yemen. At the time it was North Yemen, um, and was there for two years, and studied Arabic intensively there. Um, I came back and worked for the Peace Corps for two years in Washington at the period when uh, the Soviet Union was falling apart. Mm -hmm. So we set up our programs in Albania, Poland, Hungary, Kazakhstan, so, sorry, Kyrgyzstan, a number of other mm -hmm. former Soviet uh, republics. Um, and then I got a job actually through an ad in The Economist uh, working for the UN in the West Bank, uh, f during which I used my Arabic. Um, worked in Arabic, we were monitoring intifada-related activity, I see. Uh, driving around the refugee camps and villages of the West Bank and the towns, just trying to do a daily reporting of what was happening. Um, but uh, after two years of that, I was ready for something different and actually just wrote to the Atlantic Monthly and asked if I could volunteer to do an internship just to learn the tricks of the trade. Um, and one thing led to another. That was right when the internet took off and there was a momentary expansion of the staff and I got taken on. and. Ten years later, I was um, uh, doing a lot there, um, editing Just primarily, editing, but then also yeah. writing. I did a number of articles on you know, pretty much whatever interested me. Um, and then The Atlantic was moved to Washington in 2006. And we, we're, we live in Boston, we've got kids in the schools, we just decided we didn't want to move, and I decided that, that was the time to try something I'd wondered about a lot, which was writing books. Um, and I had seen uh, a recent press release about the sale of the Waldseemuller map, which had been yeah. s sold to the Library of Congress for $10 million. And initially I thought I might do an article about it. It just grew and grew and grew. It was a, just a mother load of stories and information. And um, that was the first book. Then the Da Vinci book grew out of the first book. And now I'm trying to figure out what's going to grow out of 
Both of these. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we're very happy on the, your 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 reading fans are very happy to hear that there'll be some more books in the offing here. But uh, before I ask more about that, I'd just like to say that uh, your Atlantic, your articles in general, but one in particular about religions. Um, and how religions proliferate and that you compare them in a sense to mutations in evolu evolution and so on. And this has gone on over the ages and it gives a very nice perspective about human thinking. Um, uh, this, there's a similar thing in, if you will, in ideology. So there's mm -hmm. a sort of a secular version of that. And you see it, of all things, in science. I imagine you, you see it in academe, generally, yeah. certainly, yeah. where there are sort of belief systems in there and people have difficulty getting past those. Yeah. So we're living in an interesting, in a sense, Renaissance age. Maybe we're, yeah. we're forced to make some changes. But let me ask, uh, in closing, about your next project, do you have anything in mind? Do you want any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always open to suggestions. I, uh, I, and I, I haven't nailed down exactly what I want to do, but I'm, I'm toying with the idea of doing something comparable to what I did in the fourth part of the world for geography, but this time with chronology, with time. Yeah. Um, kind of a, a, a sweep over a lot of terrain, trying to fix how people's idea of time um, you know, in, in Renaissance days, in the Middle Ages, there really wasn't a concept of the timeline. People mm -hmm. really didn't mm -hmm. have a sense of how to you know, have a single timeline and place all of these different historical events and figures on that timeline. So there's the development of the timeline in the first place, which is a, a, a dramatic achievement. And right. it's, it's and another... it's everywhere now. It's everywhere. We take it for granted now. Yeah. Um, and then um, all of a sudden, in uh, the end of the 1700s and beginning of the 1800s, people start to study geology and fossils and begin to realize that the 6,000 years or so that had generally been assumed to be the age of the earth for biblical reasons basically yeah. just couldn't be right and all of a sudden instead of 6,000 years within 50 years you've got a world that is millions and millions and hundreds of millions of years old that to me is a kind of shift of a Copernican nature all of a sudden everything changes uh, so if I can if I can figure out how to make a story out of that that's also a compelling read that's what I'm going to do. I can't wait. And I'm sure that your other fans will also be eagerly waiting. And in closing, I want to say, I think that you're going to be at the Belmont Library in your book tour thing. You're going to be at the Belmont Library. Is it at, uh, March 22nd? Thurs is it? Thursday, March 22nd okay, at 730. 7.30. Mm -hmm. So for people in the Belmont area, this is a good chance. And I know you've been at numerous other venues mm -hmm. uh, in the past month or so with your uh, book tour. I wish you all the best. I thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. And uh, I hope everybody will read these books. You're in for a huge treat. Thank you very much. Thanks.